Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. And thank you especially to the people who have made this possible for you with their support at patreon.com slash SW7x7. So we are wrapping up our rewatch of The Acolyte Season 1. Yes, it has been quite the ride and... <laughs> It's maybe a little odd to be re-watching it so soon after the initial run. But yeah, we're drawing connections that we might have forgotten otherwise. And so while it's all fresh in our minds, let's talk about this last episode and about the season as a whole. One of the things I want to talk about has to do with something we talked about related to the sixth episode and the fact that somebody should have warned Osha about the dangers of wearing Sith helmets, right? Because things go badly when you put those on and it didn't seem like anything bad was going to happen at the end of episode six it seemed like it was just going to be dramatic that she put it on in the first place but yes now <laughs> the bad things happen and the way the bad things happen well one of the things we talked about during our discussion of episode six is a story in the comics of Lord Momin or Darth Momin who you know, had this helmet and he possessed that helmet and any time anybody got near that helmet, it could corrupt them. It happened in a Lando comic series. There was a usage of it in a Darth Vader comic series. That thing was definitely not to be trifled with. Same thing kind of happened here, but what's different about this is the way that Chimir reacts to it. You saw in the episode where his eyes went black, very similar to how Padawan Torben's eyes went black when Mother Anisea possessed him in the first episode, the first flashback episode, right? And we also see that you change in environment, right? Like going from the full color to the desaturated situation where something else is going on and Chimera is aware of that something else going on. It's very much like the possession situation. In other words, it's as if there is a member of that force cult of witches, if you want to call it that, or that coven, if you will, that's who is possessing the helmet. <laughs> It seems like that's the only logical answer, and because Mother Coral is the only witch that we know of that's outstanding there, it does make you wonder whether Mother Coral's essence is inside that helmet. Now, in the sixth episode, what Chimera said to Osho was, if she put the helmet on, like, it's just her in the Force, and whatever you bring with you, right? Like, very similar language to Yoda talking to Luke about going into the tree on Dagobah. And according to the conversations that Chimere and Osha had in that sixth episode, there's a lot of anger and fear that's being brought into that, and sadness. And watching this with my son, once Osha pulled off the helmet, he said, yeah, did you see that? There was a red glow in her eye. And sure enough, there was, and that's probably worth paying attention to. She sees the future. She sees May killing Saul without a weapon, of course. She mistakes May for herself, which is kind of funny. And speaking of connections to the coven of Force Witches, it's also interesting that we see Chimer pull his disappearing act yet again, and I guess it raises the question and we've kind of talked about this too, the possibility that Chimere was somehow actually connected the, with this coven at some point, and can he turn himself into a smoke monster as well? If there was a connection, then it would have to be well before Brendok, right? Because the witches came to Brendok as a means of escape. They were trying to avoid being exterminated, and we don't know what the rest of their coven looked like. Circling back to Osha, though, Everything is about her negative feelings, if you will. The feelings that, as she says to Chimere in the sixth episode, the feelings that lead to the dark side, which he just dismisses with semantics, which, you know, is it? Maybe, maybe not. But she ultimately identifies the fact that she was never able to reconcile her negative feelings as the reason why she failed within the Jedi Order. And that goes beyond what she and Master Saul had talked about in the previous episode. Previously, uh, yeah, earlier on in the season, it was about her grief and not being able to let go of the grief. But it isn't just about grief. It's about her anger about what happened with May and what happened to her entire family, her resentment of the situation. Seeing May alive brought that back all fresh, but of course, it just got exponentially worse when she found out that the truth had been kept from her all along and Saul was 
hiding the fact that he actually killed her own mother. Speaking of Master Saul, we were talking about how he got May under lock and key and said, I've been thinking about what I would tell you, and so now I'm going to tell you. And so we talked about how what he told her basically seems like he was justifying the things that he did, the rationale and the reasoning for it, and just saying like the only thing he regretted it is that he hadn't been able to save her initially, right? But his talk about going to the High Council, it had seemed like all of this time, he was talking about going to the High Council to confess what actually happened on Brendock all those years ago. We find out in this episode that that's not in fact the case. What is the case is that now that May is alive, he is able to prove the existence of a virgence on Brendock. This is what he was actually concerned about. He was not interested in repenting or confessing some sort of crime to the Jedi Council because he still feels like he did the right thing. To say nothing of the fact that he developed an unhealthy fatherly attachment to Osha, which, you know, that never should have happened. I mean, I do wonder why they didn't just connect Osha with a different Jedi Master under the circumstances, right? I mean, Master Indara would have to have seen what was happening in the Master Padawan relationship developing between Saul and Osha, and... Indara didn't want to see Osha lose her dream, especially in the face of everything else that happened to her. And so it becomes fascinating and fitting that Mei, who had been going through this whole season wanting to kill all the Jedi who were on Brendok, now she wants Saul to be brought to justice. She doesn't want to kill him, she wants him to suffer. And she also, by doing this, proves the point that she was definitely not going to be Chimera's ideal pupil. Like, it was just never in the cards. She wasn't into it the same way that he had hoped she would be into it. And he gives her <laughs> the kind of Emperor Palpatine-like <laughs> prompt to strike him down and your journey to the dark side will be complete. But... Yeah, she won't do it, but she does get him to finally admit that he killed Mother Anisea and do it within earshot of Osha, which then triggers, of course, everything else. And speaking of the original trilogy, by the way, <laughs> we have talked about the prequel trilogy a lot in these discussions about the Acolyte, but not a lot about the original trilogy. And there's a reference to each of those OT movies in this final episode. I just mentioned the Return of the Jedi one. For the Empire Strikes Back one, when Osha and May are getting out of that fortress, May leads Osha down to where there's a tunnel that she ended up getting out of the fortress from. And that tunnel is very reminiscent of one of the tunnels that Luke Skywalker gets sucked to into at the end of The Empire Strikes Back. And then at the very end of the episode when Vernestra is talking to the mind-wiped May, she asks for her help in finding someone who is this someone, a pupil of mine before he turned to evil, which is how Obi-Wan describes Anakin slash Darth Vader in A New Hope. A couple of uh, other last little trivial bits to share. Um, as I said, I was watching it with my son and my son said, where are the bodies? looking at Saul going through the fortress compound where all of the force witches had died once Master Indara cleared them out of Kelnaka. And yeah, there should have been skeletons or something, but it doesn't seem like there was anything there. So that may be something to put in the back of your mind for potential season two. And I also liked something that he observed when Osha brings the lightsaber to bear on Chimere. Uh, my son said, I've never seen a lightsaber be activated mid-bleed and said, that's sick, which is, you know, obviously very complimentary. So kudos to the team making the Acolyte for impressing my 16-year-old with that one. So we end the season with Osha making a deal with Chimere and having established that he will act fairly because he has kept his word for the most part across the entirety of the season. May gets mind wiped and is able to escape successfully. Osha has seemingly completed a journey to the dark side, although I have a feeling there's a lot farther to fall. <laughs> we might find out more about that in an eventual season two. And apparently Manny Jacinto just gave an interview where he said that the final shot of the season with the two of them holding hands and looking out 
to the horizon that there is a version of that scene where he and Osha kiss at the end of it and that they thought, eh, maybe that was a bridge too far. But ultimately, you kind of suspect that this is where things are going. So that's what I've got for you in our rewatch, a deeper dive, if you will, into The Acolyte episode, which is the eighth episode of The Acolyte series and season one. And that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast, but it's also going to do it for a lot more. So I mentioned at the beginning that there was going to be a bit of an announcement at the end of this episode. And so this is it. Now, I don't know if you've been watching or listening to this for days, weeks, months, years, but I've been doing this every single day for more than 10 years now. And after a lot of soul searching, a lot of conversations about the podcast and about its sustainability and about what this could be and how it could evolve over into a second decade of the show, I've decided that it is time to officially take a hiatus. So this episode, episode 3,677, which seems only appropriate that there's a 7x7 seven seven at the end of the number of this episode, this episode is going to be the last episode of what I'm referring to as season one of the podcast. I'm going to be taking a three-month-ish hiatus. There's something that I need to do that I haven't had the time to do. For the past nearly five years, I've been wanting to finish a book that I wanted to write expanding on the ideas that I shared in the TEDx talk on Hope and Star Wars that I gave in November of 2019. So here we are nearly five years later and I haven't had time to finish the book and it's something that feels like life's work kind of stuff to me. And so I want to finish that and I'm aiming for a Life Day release this year. I'm expecting the podcast to go live with season two at that point as well. I don't think it's going to be a daily situation. It's going to look different somehow. I don't know what that's going to look like yet, but I'm excited to explore and discover and find out what's going to be next. Whatever that future holds, though, I'm just so grateful that you decided to join me for however long you've decided to join me. But I'm not dropping off the face of the earth either. If you're not connected with me on social media accounts, Instagram is SW7X7, TikTok is SW7X7, Twitter is SW7X7 Podcast. I hope you'll connect with me in the show there. And so for the last time here for season one of Star Wars 7x7, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the podcast, as always. And may the Force be with you, wherever in the world you may be. By seven is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, but their respective trademark and copyright holders may the force be with them. All original content is copyrighted by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.